Hello, it's me again. All right, um, cool. Hello, it's me. This person. Behold. Still talking about vampire movies, but today I'm talking about groovy 60s vampires. Vampires enjoying Herman's Hermits and lead paint. I bought this tie to go with a suit that I wore to an event a few years ago. But when my dad saw it, he asked um, if I'd borrowed it from his bad tie collection. And that was a sincere question from him, but to this day, it is the third, fourth sickest burn that has ever been leveled upon me. Second sickest by a blood relative. And, and I know, I know that on hearing that, you probably want to like, level a sick burn upon me just to like get higher up the list but you can't don't even try you you can't <laughs> some mean relatives so today i'm talking about bloodsucker's handbook this movie was first released in black and white as enchiridion and then re-released in color as bloodsucker's handbook the version i watched and the version i'll be taking clips from today was bloodsucker's handbook so if i slip up and call it enchiridion uh that's only because enchiridion is a more fun word to say The director of this movie, Mark Beale, said that he didn't so much set out to make a vampire movie as he set out to make a surreal movie with a vampire in it. And uh, yeah, yeah, well done. You did that. That's A plus. That's heavy, man. That's heavy. So the movie begins with an FBI agent recruiting a priest, Noah, to translate a book for them. The book is the Enchiridion Sanguisuge, or Bloodsucker's Handbook. It was being written by a suspect they now have in custody called Kondu. Uh, and by the way, this sounds like a really good, like, Delta Green setup. Take note. Enchiridion Sanguisuge, the Bloodsucker's Handbook. As in vampire. Gentlemen, is this a joke? I'm afraid not. Officially, Noah is being brought in as an expert witness to translate a document, but um, you kind of get the feeling that uh, he was just brought in because, like, these FBI agents kind of just panicked. <laughs> like, you know when you're in over your head and you call your dad? Not really because you think he'll be able to help. Um, you just kind of need some dad energy. You just, like... You just talk, you just want to talk to one of your parents about this. I, I feel like these two, I feel like these two Asians were having a conversation and like one of them was like, um, I don't know, should, should we get a priest? And this one was like, yes, yes, that's a great idea. Let's get a priest. A priest will know what to do here. So Noah meets Kondo and like brings him a little baggie of, little baggie of blood. Mind if I ask you a question then? Oh, fun a little shit, aren't we? And like, they have a pretty normal sort of introductory conversation that kind of feels like a... Feels like a romance movie a little. Do you sleep in a coffin? I have been known to. Like, yeah, it feels... Feels a little like a romance movie. <laughs> like, this movie is a lot of things, and that's a point I'm going to keep bringing up, is that this movie kind of is a bunch of different kinds of movie. <laughs> like, it's it's a horror movie, it's a detective movie, it's kind of a romance movie. Noah, this man hasn't said a word since we brought him in. He has been sitting in that chair, not speaking, barely moving, for three weeks. I don't know why, but he chose to talk to you. So Noah starts translating the book and learns the history of Vlad Tepes, the first vampire. Our history began in 1462, when Vlad Tepes stood in the Carpathian Mountains as a bastion of Christianity against the Ottoman invaders. This is where the movie really, like, steps into what it's about. They clearly didn't have the budget to do, like, a live-action period drama performance, so instead they do the whole thing in stop motion, and it's like... There's rules. <laughs> Within a year, he had regained his throne, which he ruled with wickedness and malice. This is great. This is awesome. You can never really tell if Kondu is telling the truth or if he's fucking with you. Likewise, Noah's perception kind of can't be trusted either. A and B positive. Mid-30s. In shape with 
with a hint of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. And you get to this scene where Noah's mother is telling him the story, and it's a true story of Mike the Headless Chicken, where um, basically a farmer incorrectly decapitated a chicken and it still had its brainstem, so it was like walking around and it lived for about 18 months. The meal became the pet. <laughs> So this is where we get into something I really like about this movie and really want to convey is that this movie is doing so many different things at once with a script that is very sparse. Like this conversation is, a, it's a mother expressing disappointment that her son never learned how to have fun. It's a son talking around but never really bringing up a traumatic incident from his past. It's. Noah trying to give a version of his life that he thinks will keep his mother from worrying, it's a mother worrying nonetheless. If this was a romance movie, this would be the scene where the protagonist visits her parents and they bring up that she's single and they say something gross about her fertility. If this is a noir detective movie, this is the scene where the protagonist visits an old associate of his and they have a conversation that on the surface is just character building, but it brings about something that's central to solving the mystery. If this is a horror movie, this is where we learn a trauma from the character's past that helps them solve the mystery in front of them. And this conversation is all of those things, but it's also none of those things because it's just a mother and son who don't know how to stay in contact, but want to. This is what the astronauts use to wash their dishes. I cannot wait to try it. Very, very futuristic. So, and as Noah is translating the Ankaridian, we get what is either Kondu's backstory or the backstory of one of Kondu's ancestors or just Kondu fucking with us. It's the story of Vlad Tepesh's defeat and deal with the demon Moloch. It's kind of a cultural history of vampires born out of desperation and ultimately unsuccessful. When Vlad gets back to the castle, he learns that his wife has killed herself and his brother has converted the country to Islam, so Vlad is now banished. Was Vlad conned by Moloch? Was he just too late? And does that matter? <laughs> this story is also... Yes, it is. <laughs> you want attention? Come here. This is also just further Kondu fucking with everyone. Right after we learn that Vlad, Dracula, is the only vampire who is capable of passing the gift on to other people, we see a scene of Kondu converting someone. So kid, what's your name? Richard. Richard? You look more like a dick to me. Okay. Does this mean that Kondu is Dracula? Does this mean that Vlad gave Kondu the gift as well? Or does Kondu want people to think that the gift of creating new vampires is rare because that'll just get the fuzz off his scent? Either way, Kondu definitely converted. Wait. Wait. Dick Cheney? Okay. <laughs> If you watched my last video, you might remember me saying that more movies should get weird with it. More movies should get weird with it. Well, this movie gets weird with it. Noah's search for information takes him to a bar where this lady is just Renfielding it up. And this is where we get either what is a break from reality or the knowledge that reality has been different the whole time. Is Noah starting to hallucinate? Is he realizing what reality has been all along? Either way, this lady's single and ready to flamingo. <laughs> At this point we reach a subplot about toad licking and in grade 8 we all had to watch this documentary about like how cane toads were introduced to Queensland and it had a lengthy digression about the dangers of licking toads and um, I guess Mark Beale watched that documentary too. <laughs> Actually I am going to talk about this documentary for a bit more. Um, all they had to say, all they had to say, <laughs> the only thing that they needed to say was that cane toads secrete a poison through certain glands onto their skin and if that poison gets onto your hands, wash your hands immediately. If it gets into your mouth, contact poison control. Th they did not need to have an interview with a guy who had a habit of either licking them or like drying their skin and smoking them and just talking about how great 
<laughs> that was like it had the problem that a lot of anti-drug PSAs have in that it made the drugs seem fun it's all like I was in this gremlin can you not do that actually can you stop doing that it's very distracting so bear in mind, I was 13 and I'm watching this with a bunch of other 13 year olds. And all we remember is this guy talking about his trip on toad venom. Like for weeks afterwards, we were referencing the line to each other that he saw the world through the eyes of a cactus. I'm going to I'm going to search for this movie, I, I, this documentary. I want to know if it's real or if I just hallucinated it while I was having my wisdom teeth out. Don, Don Juan uh, says that uh, so, so some of the South American Indians, they, uh, when they get the, the mescaline out of the cactus, they say that and have it that you actually start to see the world through the consciousness of the cactus, um, that you start to see what the world looks like from the eyes of the cactus. And your toad's the same. So anyway, Enchiridion, is it vampirism? Is it toad licking? Is it both? So Bloodsucker's Handbook was clearly made by people who didn't have a lot of money, but did have time. And that really shows, especially in scenes where uh, there's any kind of physical confrontation, because it's very clear they didn't have money to hire stunt performers. <laughs> like, like, this is a passion project and I love it for that. Uh, there are multiple characters who have tattoos that were clearly drawn on with pen right before they, took, they did the take. Something I really enjoy is not having cat hair in my nose. Something I really enjoy is that Kondu uh, kind of doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Like you're used to these like ancient, intelligent arch vampires who have like lived forever and seen everything and know everything. And Kondu certainly has that kind of confidence. Uh, what he doesn't really have is a whole lot of uh, knowledge <laughs> about anything at all. May I call you Noah then? It's an Old Testament name. He lived to be 950 years old. Care to know how? <laughs> you thought I was gonna say he was just like me. Nope. People just lived longer then. Before all this radiation in the air. Before the cloud layer collapsed. 100% confidence, no brains. He's, he's manipulative and he's scheming and he knows exactly how to get into Noah's head, but he's also kind of just a messy drama queen. <laughs> no thoughts, head empty. Like a sort of evil himbo, like a himbad. And this is one of the great things about Kondu as a character because there's a lot of layers to him, but there's also nothing to him. He's, <laughs> he's, he's simultaneously this tragic figure who can't live in a society, but he's also very manipulative and dangerous. He's very charismatic in the way that like a televangelist is charismatic, but he's also flirtatiously charismatic. He's a great counterpoint to Noah, who you, you get the feeling he really does care about his parishioners, but he just kind of doesn't quite have the skills to be a, a leader in faith in the way that they need him to be. Compare this to Kondu, who is great as a faith leader. He's charismatic, he's fun, he's interesting, but it's 100% predatory. He's just one of those very dangerous kind of people who knows exactly what makes people tick. He knows how to get people into people's heads and give them what they need, or at least what they think they need, but he just doesn't give a shit about what happens to them. Like all movie vampires, Kondu is a metaphor, but he is also literally a vampire. It's a metaphor for addiction, it's a metaphor for toxic relationships, it's a metaphor for charismatic leaders of dangerous movements. We're in Metaphor City! Is this detective literally a greyhound? Or is he just representative of Noah losing his grip on reality in the wake of an event he can't explain? Or is he a hallucination? Yes! Just stay behind me. Things go bad, I tail it out of here. Obviously this movie isn't perfect, like it has a lot of flaws that are just kind of 
down to the fact that they didn't have enough of a budget, and those are charming in their own way. I would have liked to get more character building from the few female characters there are, but that would have required adding more dialogue to a script that I don't think could necessarily support it. There's also a prequel to the movie called Bloodsucker's Planet. Um, it has a lot of the very weird charm that Bloodsucker's Handbook has, um, but overall I think it, I just enjoyed it less. No place has a moon like here. Though I will say that the last shot of Bloodsucker's Planet is legitimately quite chilling, and I recommend it just for that. So yeah, I recommend watching Bloodsucker's Handbook if you can find it. Um, maybe you'll love it, maybe you'll love it for the same reason I did. Maybe it won't land for you, that's also allowed. Alright, uh, anyway. Here's my top 5 Draculas. Number 5, Bela Lugosi. He's kind of so well known as Dracula that I have to put him on this list, and I think he's a good Dracula, I'm just not that much a fan of the Universal Dracula movies. I think the Frankenstein movies are really where Universal shone in that era, but I am a big fan of these armadillos. Go you little guys. Bela Lugosi's Dracula is a dude who glides about being weird and foreign and staring people down. I never drink. Why? Oh Dracula, you tease. There are people on Earth for whom a weird foreigner is the scariest thing imaginable. But his performance incorporates what is, to me, the scariest thing on Earth. Prolonged eye contact. Number four, the one from Buffy. I'm Dracula. Get out! Extra. Fabulous. Loving it. This isn't so much here as a performance of Dracula as it is about the utilization of Dracula. In a show that's about hunting vampires, of course she fights the most famous of vampires. And that's cool as hell. I'm kind of disappointed she didn't get to fight an Osferatu. Number three, Christopher Lee. Some Hammer Draculas are good and have Christopher Lee in them. Some Hammer Draculas are bad and have Christopher Lee in them. Some Hammer Draculas are bad and do not have Christopher Lee in them. But there are no Hammer Draculas that are good and do not have Christopher Lee in them. Number two, Clay's Bang. There's no one living here. Oh, Dracula, you tease. Honourable mention goes to Sean McAuliffe. Ah, a pack of the burger rings, thanks, Roy. I got chips for a dragon. Okay, well, sour cream and chives flavour, please. And of course, number one, if you watched my video about Van Helsing, this will not surprise you at all. It's Richard Roxburgh. Look at him go. It bears mentioning that Dracula is a public domain character, so no matter what you're working on creatively, you should consider putting a Dracula in it. I don't know anything about you, or your life, or what you're working on, but it's possible that what it needs is a Dracula. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like what I do, there's YouTube things that you can do. You can like, comment, subscribe, you know how this goes. Kat, can you stop making a lot of noises? I'm trying to thank the viewers. You're involved now. Alright. Like and subscribe. Give me money on Patreon if you want to. Uh, there's all these perks, like behind the scenes stuff, and you can get your name in the credits, just like my one patron who has pledged at that level. <laughs>